Okay. I believe we are happening. I believe we're happening. Yes, and there's somebody. There's Christy. Hello, Christy. How are you? And, ah, so as you can see, um, I am in the midst of a vastly reduced amount of stuff because um, we've been, I've been, well, debt's help too. We've been taking things out. You can see all the books gone, all the pictures gone from the walls. There's a lot of pictures in this house. And that's one of the questions that I have is what are we going to do with all of our pictures? Because we're not going to have room for them in the new place. And we didn't have room for all of them here. I don't think we even had room for them in the house before this. It's been a long time since we've had room for all our pictures, but that's okay. That's all right. Pictures are are good things, but they don't all have to be up at once. Um, even the best museums have many of their pictures in the back. So that's how it's going to have to go. Hi, nice to see you. I am Tad. I am here to read. And as far as I know, I am here to also um, make sure everything else works properly too tonight. <laughs> that's the idea anyway. Um, let me check in. Well, actually, let me just let me see if there's anything else to tell about. It's been um, it's been a, a, a busy week. Um, and those of you who know know that we're in the middle of moving, and uh, it's not a project I'm particularly happy about, but it's a project that has to happen. So I am doing my best to participate with good nature. Um, but I'm really tired of it and it's been going on for weeks and it's still going to go on for a couple of weeks more and then there will be all the setting up on the other end and the making sure the yards are dog safe and the house is cat safe because the cat has to be kept away from the dog, which is, whoops, which is why she lives down here in the first place. And, um, and I will have to get back to work again because it's driving me nuts not being able to work. Um, so, well, I mean, I'm doing a lot of work, you know, there's different meanings of the word here. Um, and I'm certainly working a lot. I'm putting things in boxes and dragging things out and clearing the garage and doing all kinds of things. So it, there, in that sense, there's a lot of work happening in the sense of me doing the work that I need to do to stay sane. No, that is not happening at the moment. Um, so I'm still, I'm clinging to sanity, but just just fingernails just fingernails it's it's amazing i come to realize how much of um how much of my coping mechanism for stressful times is being able to work on books it's being able to write being able to sit around and think up story ideas and plotting and all that kind of stuff and when that's taken away from me it's like there's not as much left as I would like, um, especially when one is physically tired at the end of the day from sh shifting boxes and things like that. And um, normally I like to just be able to turn my brain off and, or at least turn off that part of my brain and, and um, you know, think about other things and retreat to my, my world of made up stories to, to, you know, kind of revivify myself to, to replenish my energies. But that can't happen at the moment because there's too much to do and it requires a certain amount of brain power to be able to focus. And it requires also for me anyway, it requires being able to work in regular intervals so that you can think and then you can sit down and you can make things happen. That is not um, happening at the moment and it hasn't happened for several weeks. So as you can see, it's somewhat frustrating for me, but we're moving forward. As you can see from the relative bareness of the, I mean, there's still just stuff all over the place here, but much of it has gone into boxes and, um, or is waiting to go into boxes or has already been moved out into the garage. If it was bigger than a bread basket. Um, so we're, we're getting there. We're moving forward and life continues and everybody else is otherwise well, Deb's well, the, uh, the young people in our family are all fairly well and hanging in and, um, the pets, 
except Johnny gets really nervous because among other things where I have to like, I'm putting things in suitcases because there's no point in taking a suitcase and having leaving it empty um, when there's so much stuff that will have to be moved. So I keep taking out suitcases and filling them with underwear and socks and things like that, which, you know, is a perfectly logical thing to do. But the problem is that to Johnny, it signifies that I'm going on a trip. Um, because, of course, that's what always happens before I fly off to Europe for a couple of weeks or something, you know, when I'm doing a book tour or around the country or wherever. So every time Johnny sees the suitcase, his, you know, his ears sag and his tail goes down and, you know, he just looks miserable. And it's really hard to explain. I, 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 I feel this pain at not being able to tell him it's okay. We're all going together. Yes, it'll be weird, but you're always going to be part of the, you know, that all the things you want to tell a dog, just like a really, really small child before they're old enough to understand English. Um, but the kids eventually grow out of it. Most of them do anyway. Um, some don't, and they become Congress people. But the rest of them do grow out of it, but dogs don't. And so I'm doing my best to communicate to Johnny. Um <laughs> that it's okay. He's going with me this time. It's not a trip that I'm taking without him. Anyway, let me check and see who is with me this evening, or at least who has signed in to say hello. Um, and again, Petra, thank you for the kind words, Petra. And Christina, I'm, 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 I'm hoping that uh, everything will go smoothly from here on out. Hazel! My dear mother-in-law, hello, sweetie. Good to see you. Um, everybody's fine here. We are all, all, uh, we're all getting things done. That's all we can really do at that at the moment. I'm sure you know how that is. Uh, Debbie wants to know how will Johnny cope with the move. Uh, he'll be freaked out. He's, you know, since he came to live with us, he was a foster. But since he came to live with us, he's only lived in this one house where he has a huge outdoors area to run around in, which will not be at true of the next place. Um, there is a backyard. There is a yard. Um, but fortunately, unlike where we are, islanded up in the hills and have been for a long time on a, on a street where Johnny, early on when he got out once, he actually got hit by a car. He wasn't badly hurt, but he, he, it freaked him out. Needless to say, and it was completely his fault. He, he panicked in the rain and got out and ran out into a street right in front of a lady driving down. Um, so he was okay after, you know, some vet care and stuff, but he's never gotten over it and he does not like much walking on our street. So it, going taking Johnny for a walk has always required putting him in a car and taking him somewhere else. So one of the nice things about where we'll be living for at least the next year or two um, is that we will be able to walk him out the front door and just take him for walks in my old neighborhood. So Johnny will probably be okay. Um, I will be a little freaked out. Um, I am already a little freaked out because it's like where I grew up. It's my, you know, it's my parents' home. It's my old neighborhood from my childhood and um, it doesn't feel like a triumphant return so it's kind of weird um, on the other hand it's a you know Palo Alto is a nice town and that's where we'll be living so you know and and, and there will be lots of um, what's the word I'm looking for mitigating circumstances to the situation that will be good so I'm not complaining but both Johnny and I are going to have to go through a period of adjustment. Anyway, let me say, I, I already said hello to Petra and Christina. And there's my mother-in-law, Hazel. Hello again, Hazel. Good to see you. Kristen, thank you for joining us. Andre, a pleasure. Dirk, Dirk, good to see you. And Mahmoud, good to see you too. And there's Chris. It's like all of you guys are, are such regulars now. Wouter, Iris. Rosalba, Anamika, Ray, Debbie, Carol. Um, that's Carol Aitken. And let me see who else is on the list here. Nicole and Nikki. That's Nikki Chetwin and Nicole Grass. 
And Ilva is there. Hello, sweetie. Good to see you. And Tracy. And anybody else? Um, I think that's, yeah, probably a few other people. But um, I can only read off, as I've mentioned in the past. There's Sally. She just showed up. Um, I can only read. I can only see the people who have. And Alexandra. Hello. Alexandra Van L. Okay. So Sally and Alexandra have now showed up on the list too. So I can only, um, at the moment, until I have some peace of mind and can figure it out, I, I can't see comments very well. It's hard to explain. Anyway, it's not important either. Except just in so much as it's made me a bit less responsive than I have been previously. Um, so, but I, it's something I'll figure out when I get a chance to figure it out. Let me think, is there anything else? No, because I'm just like, this is just it for me at the moment. It's just get up every day and say what crap has to be put into boxes and what stuff has to be done this with and when is the such and such showing up and, you know, our, and oh, and, and the other thing, and I think I've mentioned this, is we also... We're fixing all these things that we hadn't fixed before because we're going to rent the house. So as a result, we've got some very nice builders, but they're in, you know, like putting new floors in the bathrooms and new vanities and stuff like that. And um, so it's hideously noisy all the time. It's the sound of saws and drills and hammers and all this stuff. And again, they're really that we, we really are have been very, very fortunate with the people who've been working in the house um <coughs> excuse me uniformly good people so no complaints about that but it has been you know it's it's constant noise and you know at any given time one or two of the bathrooms are are ripped apart and you know so it's it's mildly stressful all right i have complained enough i think um so what i'm going to do is i'm going to start reading from where we stopped last time, last Sunday evening. And again, I apologize to those of you who are with me this evening, and I'm going to do my absolute level best not to um, touch anything. Although I, I had an experience, actually this is interesting, um, which was that last time it just, it, it, that when I was dealing with, uh, when I was reading for you guys, it just, went off and I didn't know why. And then the next night, um, during the 7 p.m. reading, it told me that it was off the air, that it was no longer alive. And so like I panicked, but having slowly, I learned lessons slowly. And having at least said to myself, who knows what's going on here? I asked, and it turned out it hadn't gone off the air. It had just told me that it, that it had, that I was no longer broadcasting. So there's something weird in the Facebook stream that sometimes just goes off and didn't have anything to do with me the last time. So it may not have the previous time either. I don't know. Anyway, that's just to tell you that I am paying attention to these things. I am not completely blithe and ignorant about them. I am trying to figure out what's, what, what has been the problems. But now that that is said, and I have apologized for last time, I am going to uh, start reading. Okay. Sorry, I'm a bit scattered this weekend because of just another long week. Anyway, so where we were was that, um, I believe it's Lucinda. Yeah, Lucinda has gone out with Ragnar. They've been staying at the Carrillo's house, and Lucinda's gone out with Ragnar to the edge of the property because Ragnar is meeting with uh, Mr. Walkwell about what's going on back at the house. Okay, so that's what's going on. As they're doing so, um, as they're doing so, Lucinda has a sudden, it's not an intuition because it's an actual communication, a communication from the dragon that something is going on that is not a good idea, I think. Oh, maybe that hasn't happened yet. Oh, maybe that hasn't happened. Maybe that's just about to happen. Okay. Anyway, so Lucinda and Ragnar are meeting with Mr. Walkwell. It is not me who needs your pity, Mr. Walkwell told them. Every time the witch brings Gideon out to have him give orders, he seems 
slower, weaker, and more stupid, like a tree that does not get enough water. I fear for him. The idea of her great uncle growing sicker and sicker at, Mr. Ne at Mrs. Needle's hands made Lucinda's heart race with fear. It's the greenhouse. I know there's something in there. I can give you the letter I found if you want to see it. There's something really bad in there, and I'm sure it's what Mrs. Needle is using to control Uncle Gideon. Mr. Walkwell only looked at her, not as though he didn't believe her, but as if it didn't matter. Ragnar shook his head sadly. If I could simply break the witch's neck, I would, the Norseman said. But the gods only know whether we would ever get Gideon back afterward. The same if we simply took him away from her. As long as he is in her power, she knows we dare not do anything. Ragnar speaks the truth, child, Mr. Walkwell told her. But what about the thing that got Gideon and me? I will not let anyone go near the greenhouse. That you need not fear. Mr. Walkwell turned to look over his shoulder, back toward Ordinary Farm. The wind was changing. Even Lucinda could feel that. Another storm coming, he sighed. By Olympus, what next? That settles it, Ragnar said. I am coming with you. The sick animals will have to be penned. You cannot get it done in time on your own. The big man vaulted the fence with the ease of someone a quarter his age. I know it is hard for you to wait, Lucinda, but I will come back this evening and tell you everything I have seen. Go back to the house now. The storm may bring lightning. We'll bring lightning, said Mr. Walkwell darkly, and only the muere, only the fates themselves can say what else. We'll come with it. Carrot girl! She could hear it as clearly as if someone had spoken it into her ear. The name, or more precisely, the idea that the young dragon Desta used for Lucinda. The sound that was not a sound came again. Carrot girl! Help! Lucinda had fallen asleep on the air mattress in Carmen's room. In fact, she realized she was still at least half asleep, but she didn't dare open her eyes for fear of losing touch with the frightened dragon. She had never dreamed the creature's thoughts could reach her this far from the farm. I'm here, Desta. What's wrong? Too much wrong. All wrong. Frightened. And it wasn't just herself the young dragon was worried about. Meseret. Lucinda felt it as an image, not a name, the huge, warm, shadow thought that represented Desta's mother. She, hungry, too. Other animals escape, growling, scaring Desta, others running and shouting. And even as these ideas fluttered and whirled through her mind like panicky bats, Lucinda could feel something else as well. Desta was trying to fly. Lucinda could sense the young dragon straining at her harness, struggling to let her wings pull her up into the air. She's ready. Even in the midst of so much confusion and fright, Lucinda felt a swelling of excitement. She's ready to fly. Tell me what's going on, Desta. What's happening? Everything bad. Bad smell. Animals. Out hunting. For a moment, she could almost see what Desta saw, a slouching, four-legged shadow, a pale, orange-eyed face peering into the reptile barn, and a cold shiver ran down Lucinda's spine, even though she was miles away. One of the manticores was out. Lucinda sat up. Carmen's room was empty and dim, the light of the dying evening turning the long window into a glowing violet rectangle. She could faintly hear the television in Grandma Paz's room down the hall. Outside, the trees thrashed in a strong wind, and a few raindrops were already spattering against the window. The dragon's thoughts suddenly vanished from her head. Concentrate, Lucinda told herself. Hang on. 
just a second here. Do 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 do. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Concentrate, Lucinda told herself. Desta? Desta, can you still hear me? The moment of contact now felt slippery as a piece of soap at the bottom of a bath or a watermelon seed squirting across a plate each time she tried to close her fingers on it. Concentrate. And there it was, but only for a moment, the last dwindling perceptions that came from the terrified dragon. Running things! The ideas flitted across Lucinda's mind like shadows on a window shade. Wind and growing darkness, warm rain making all the smells strange, and the hunting things still lurking outside the reptile barn, but working up their courage to come in. There was more than one of them now, and they were barking to each other, excited chuffing noises like an axe biting into wood. Lucinda's skin went cold. <coughs> was all that really happening? Could it possibly be just some kind of dragon nightmare? But in her heart, she knew it was all too real. Since the first moment she had seen Gideon's new watchdogs, the manticores had terrified her. But how had they gotten out? And more importantly, and more importantly, if it had taken Alamu to kill just one of them, how on earth would anybody at the farm be able to get all the rest back into their cage? Tears of worry running down both cheeks, Lucinda leaped up and sprinted down the hallway. Tyler! She shouted as she burst out the back door and headed for the garage. She saw that the boys had set their tent up inside it. The canvas was lit from within, but she couldn't hear them. Tyler! It's the farm! Something's really wrong on the farm! No reply. No movement. Tyler, don't play games! She yanked back the flap and leaned in. I just, Desta, just... She stopped when she realized it was pointless. The tent was empty, but for a clutter of comic books and video game magazines. Tyler and Steve weren't there. With Carmen and Alma, and when she finally understood what had happened, with Grandma Paz as well, Lucinda turned the Carrillo's house upside down but found no sign of the boys anywhere. Where could they be? cried Paz. Are they playing a trick with us? Carmen came out of the kitchen. No, they're really gone. They took food with them. Bologna sandwiches, and of course they didn't put anything away, not even the mayonnaise. At eight o'clock at night? Grandma Paz was irritated at the mere thought. What for? They both ate like pigs at dinner. Because they're not coming back right away, Lucinda said, suddenly feeling queasy. They're... Alma came back into the house, hair dripping, carrying a piece of paper in her hand. I found a note in the tent. Paz grabbed it from her. Lucinda and the girls leaned over her shoulder to read. We're out doing important things and we'll be back soon. Don't worry about us, we're fine. My brother's allergic to apostrophes, Alma said, but she looked really frightened. Where do you think they went? Why would they go out somewhere? demanded Grandma Paz. Those peaches! And in a storm! Oh, oh no! Lucinda suddenly remembered Tyler's excitement over what Paz had told him. It's Tyler. I bet he and Steve are going to try to get back into ordinary farm. Carmen looked shocked. How could they do that? There's an electrical fence. Even my brother isn't that stupid. Lucinda slumped down onto the living room couch. I don't think that's the way they're going. She turned to Grandma Paz. Tyler said you told him there was a tunnel or something that might connect this property to Gideon's? Some underground way? The old woman's eyes opened very wide. Oh, goodness, they wouldn't go there, would they? To the old mine? That's a terrible place. 
which is exactly the kind of place my brother would go. Lucinda wanted to be angry at him, but she was terrified. What would she tell mom? He loves stuff like that. Oh, Tyler, you idiot. All because he's so worked up about Colin Needle and the contin... She suddenly realized Paz was still standing there. Never mind. What do we do? Where, where is it? How do we get them before they get themselves killed? I get my car, said Paz. I know where it is, and if they haven't been gone too long, we can beat them there. You girls, get your jackets and shoes on and get in the car. Just me or those two. I am going to tan their little culos. As Carmen and Alma ran off, Lucinda told Paz, I'm not going. Someone has to stay here to tell Ragnar what's happening. He's coming back soon. If they beat you to that mine or whatever it is, then Ragnar will have to be the one to go and get them. And if he doesn't already know about the manticores being out, she thought, well, that's something else that has to be dealt with. She wanted to cry, but couldn't afford to waste any more strength on tears. This was shaping up to be a horrible, horrible night. Grandma paused, threw her hands up in surrender. What am I thinking? I have to call Sylvia and Hector too. Tell them what those little idiotas have done. They'll come right back when they hear, so you won't be on your own long. A scant three minutes later, Lucinda stood in the driveway, watching Grandma Paz's big old car bump down the gravel driveway on its painfully slow way toward the Cresta Sol front gate. The drizzle had stopped, but the sky was cloudy and the moist, warm breeze tugged at her hair. Hurry up, Lucinda called to them, but all that came back to her was the sound of the rising wind. Chapter 27 Weird Scenes Inside the Silver Mine. Okay, before we start, let me just make sure that we've got everything where it should be. Oh, there I see various folks have showed up. Chenoa, or Chenoa, and Felina, and Suzanne. Hello. Good to see you all. I will continue. Chapter 27, Weird Scenes Inside the Silver Mine. So, uh, not trying to criticize or anything, but is this your actual plan? Steve Carrillo was a good-sized kid, with his parka billowing in the wind and the clanking of canteen and flashlight and various other implements dangling from his backpack. He looked as if someone's camping tent had pulled up stakes and escaped. I mean, like us walking about a million miles in the rain and the mud and it's getting dark. And did I mention that it's raining? Just be glad it's summer. At least it's warm. And we'll be out of the rain soon. At least Tyler hoped so. He didn't really know much about Grandma Paz's abandoned silver mine, except for where it was on the map. And he certainly didn't want to think about what they were going to do if they got there and couldn't get inside. He could already imagine what Lucinda would have to say about this latest idea of his. And it wouldn't be good thinking. Steve had started the adventure full of his usual good humor. Shouldn't we be bringing a gun or something? He asked as they set out in the hot gray-blue evening between waves of summer storm. You know, in case there are any monster-type things? Dragons? Stuff like that? A gun? Tyler was shocked and a little intrigued by the idea. You don't have a gun, Carrillo. Not really, but my uncle has a rifle he uses to shoot at crows. I could get that. And I've got my paintball rifle. Dude, you know how good I am with that. Tyler snorted. Yeah, and if we need to splatter yellow stuff on a dragon, you're my first choice. But we're just going in some tunnels. There's probably nothing down there but gophers. And snakes. And spiders. And more snakes. Steve stopped. Maybe we should think of some different way to do this, Jenkins. Grandma Paz says that place is haunted. Tyler shook his head. It's not haunted. 
it's connected to the fault line, like I explained. So every now and then something weird probably comes out of it, like back at the farm. But I know how to deal with the fault line, dude. I can totally go in and out. I've done it. Yeah, and I was there. And it sucked. Steve shuddered. Dude, some crappy monster made out of old rags or something tried to eat me the last time I went anywhere with you. That wasn't the fault line. That was the other side of the mirror. That's different. Although he didn't really know if that was true. It wasn't like he could look it up online or in a textbook or anything. I don't care if the things with teeth that want to kill us come out of a mirror or a hole in the ground or a box of cereal, Steve said forcefully. Things with teeth equal bad idea. Anyway, you went into the mirror by yourself. I was the one who got you out, remember? Still, Tyler couldn't really disagree with Steve Carrillo's basic point. Walking across the dark fields toward the looming hills, he was growing less and less fond of his own plan every minute. Tyler hoped it was a good omen that once they reached the foothills, they found the little road leading to the mine pretty easily. With their flashlights cutting a bright path through the flurrying raindrops, they hiked uphill another mile or so until they reached the mine entrance, a frame of old timber surrounding a hole in the hill just at the base of a rocky cliff. Someone had nailed some ancient gray slats across the front of it as a barrier, but there were no signs reading, Keep out, this means you, or anything else Tyler had expected from Saturday morning cartoons. A board over the entrance might once have proclaimed the mine's name, but rain and wind and sun had scrubbed the wood clean long ago. All they had to do was duck beneath it and they'd be inside. Thunder boomed in the distance. Oh, hells no! Steve said, eyeing the mine entrance with dismay. Oh, come on, look at that. That's like where zombies live. We're going in there? Zombies don't live, but yeah, that's where we're going. Tyler put down his backpack and took a swig from his canteen. You can stay out here if you like. Your folks have probably called the sheriff's office by now. They'll give you a ride home. If they even find me alive... You're a knobweed, Jenkins. I'm not sitting out here waiting for the wolves and bears to eat me. The thunder rumbled closer now. Tyler was beginning to see flickering smears of brightness over the distant hills on the other side of Standard Valley, beyond Gideon's farm. So the police or wild animals or the lightning could fry you, said Tyler. That's always a possibility, too. Steve stretched his round face into an expression of extreme disgust. I hate you so much, dude. I hate you worse than homework. Yeah, I'll go first. The first part was the easy bit. It was all stairs. They went carefully down the rough shaft on a succession of rickety old wooden ladders and steps until Tyler guessed they had descended about the depth of a four- or five-story building. Steve's grandfather and his workers, or whoever, had done their work well. The old structures creaked and swayed, but Tyler never felt like they were at serious risk, although Steve Carrillo seemed to think they were only moments away from plunging helplessly into the Earth's core. Look, Tyler said, pointing his flashlight downward. You can see the bottom. It's like climbing a tree. Just pretend this is all 64-bit. Does that mean there's a giant gorilla out there somewhere who's going to start throwing barrels at us? Ho, ho. Tyler had reached what seemed to be the beginning of the main shaft. He flashed his light around. The final ladder ended in a natural cavern, tall enough to stand in, although the three tunnels he could see opening out from there looked a lot less spacious. Which way do you think we should go? Hey, sure, said Steve. I'll just release my cyborg tracking hound. His fingers rapidly flurried the A and B buttons of an imaginary video game controller. Then he turned and frowned at Tyler. Seriously, dude, that part is your job. Tyler crouched at the base of the ladder for a moment to consider. 
He cocked his head, even took a sniff of the warm, damp air. If this had been a movie, he would have felt something or heard something and made a brilliant deduction. But this was not a movie. He flicked his flashlight beam along the walls. Batteries don't last forever, Steve reminded him, but it was the fearful undercurrent in his friend's voice that made Tyler more uncomfortable than the words. Maybe Lucinda was right. Maybe he did jump into things. Maybe he shouldn't have dragged Steve Carrillo into this crazy plan. He did his best to think calmly. If this cavern was connected somehow to the fault line, a mile away at Ordinary Farm, he reasoned, then maybe he could feel the air moving in one of the tunnels. He licked his fingers and gently moved them from side to side, then turned and did it again. There has to be a better way onto your uncle's farm than this, Tyler. I'm serious, Steve said. It's not like that English lady is going to kill him or anything. She needs him. He liked this thought. So we might as well go back to my house. Maybe my folks even know some place we can get into the tunnels, closer to your uncle's property. Tyler ignored him. He was doing his best to remember what he had felt when he had found the fault line the first time. It had been frightening, but it had also been a feeling unlike anything he'd ever had before. After a moment, he walked to the first tunnel and stood in front of it with his eyes closed and his palms held out, then moved to the second and did the same. "'What are you doing?' Steve asked. "'Asking the spirits to help you?' Eeny meeny, chilly beeny, shut up, dude, I mean it. The third tunnel at first seemed no different, but after a few moments, Tyler began to feel what seemed like a faint stirring of the air. It was enough to make up his mind. It had to be. The only other way would be trial and error. This direction, he said, then ducked his head and headed down the tunnel. He could hear Steve trudging after him, murmuring darkly to himself. How long have we been down here? Steve had been trying to edge sideways through a narrow spot in the tunnel, but he and his backpack had stuck. Tyler loosened the strap so he could slip out of it. It seems like days, Steve complained. This goes on forever. Tyler looked at his watch. It's ten. We've been down here about an hour. No way. Only an hour? Steve started to hoist the pack back onto his shoulders, then sighed. I forgot about the dark. What do you mean you forgot? Going along in the pitch dark is real creepy, man. Even with flashlights. Yeah, it's like being in another universe. Don't say that out loud. Steve dropped his pack and swore. Seriously, I need a rest. How about a snack break? Tyler nodded. When we get out of this tunnel, into the next open cave. Whoever built the mine had mostly dug tunnels to com connect a complex of natural caves, low, angular spaces walled with gray, shiny stone that looked a bit like melting ice cream. But in several places, they spread out, opened out into chambers of various sizes, a couple of them larger than a small house. <clears throat> Both boys were glad not to have seen much in the way of snakes or spiders, but they had discovered that the caves housed plenty of bats. So when they reached the next large chamber, Tyler had to look around for a while until he could find a place for them to perch without having to sit in too much bat guano. The atmosphere didn't seem to spoil Steve's appetite, though. Tyler had only taken a couple of bites from his sandwich when the last of Steve's was disappearing. So sue me, Steve said when he saw Tyler's expression. All this exercise, I was hungry. He took a huge gurgling swallow from his canteen. And thirsty? Slow down on that water. I don't know how long it's going to take us to reach the farm. Tyler was feeling better about his choice of tunnels now. The simple fact that they had been walking so long, when they weren't crawling and dragging their packs through some of the tighter passages, suggested he had picked the right tunnel to reach Ordinary Farm. You never told me what we're going to do when we get there. I totally did. 
He totally did not. It was all, we have to find out what they're doing. Like a cartoon? Like Agent Aardvark? He frowned. Which makes me Muggsy Meerkat. Crap. Well, we do have to find out what they're doing. Colin Needle and his mother. Dude, you know you're a little obsessed, right? I'm not. He's got the continuous scope, which means if he learns how to use it, he can travel in time. And his mother's got Gideon totally under control. Hypnotize, which means they can do anything they want with the farm. Steve gave him a look that clearly said, trying to keep crazy person calm. So we're supposed to mess with him? What if she puts a spell on us? What if they go back in time and kill our grandfathers or something? Oh, Lord. Did they have to start thinking about what Colin Needle could do to change things that way? In science fiction movies, that was where things always started to go really wrong. And then afterward, civilization was destroyed and everyone turned into killer mutants. So Colin Needle and his crazy, nasty mother might not just steal ordinary farm. They might accidentally or even purposely destroy the whole world. Oh, great, Tyler said out loud and slapped his hands on his thighs, disgusted he had not thought of this earlier. The sound echoed in the small high cavern and reverberated down the tunnels in either direction. He could see nothing of this and hear everything. The echo carried on repeating far longer than it should have. The smacking sound seemed to have become something else now, something a little quieter. Wait said Tyler. What's that? What's what? Steve looked from side to side, but the erratic flash of his light revealed nothing but the stone around them. Don't do that. You're freaking me out. What's what? The noise was getting louder. That sounds like footsteps. A slow patting sound. Scratch and flap. Scratch and flap. Shh! Tyler lifted his hand. Someone's coming. Dude! Steve looked about five seconds from a heart attack. He was struggling to keep his voice a whisper. His eyes were so wide the whites were almost glowing. You're joking, right? But Steve could hear it too now. It must be someone following us. My dad, maybe. Tyler said, No, listen, it's coming from the wrong direction. Oh, man, no way. Steve made a lunge back toward the tunnel through which they had come, but Tyler grabbed his jacket sleeve and held on, even as the other boy nearly pulled him off his feet. Steve, don't move. The footfalls came again. Tap, scritch, tap, scritch. Tyler turned his flashlight toward the further tunnel. Something was moving there, an angular shadow. Tyler's heartbeat stuttered and jerked. A moment later, the dark shape stepped out into the cavern in the glare of the flashlight. A bushy-haired old man with a black, in a black suit stood only a few yards away from them, blinking and trying to shield his eyes from the light. He had a huge mustache, like in schoolbook pictures of Mark Twain, and a day's growth of white whiskers on his chin. His face was familiar, Extremely familiar. Tyler could only stare with his mouth hanging open. Stephen Carrillo sounded like he had something the size of a football stuck in his throat. Dude, I've seen that guy in the library at your farm, in that picture. He sucked in air, his whispered words helium squeaky. But, but I thought he was dead. He is said Tyler, backing away from the apparition. His heart felt like it was going to jump out of his ribcage. He's totally, totally dead. Steve, that's Octavio Tinker. Chapter 28. Yeah, we have time to get well into this one. Just make sure we're still connected here. Okay. Oh, and Tash has showed up. Good. Hello, Tash. <coughs> oh, 
Okie dokie. Actually, let me fix that bit there. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Just doing a little housekeeping here. Chapter 28, Strange Allies. Lucinda had been pacing back and forth across the Carrillo's living room for the last half an hour. She couldn't concentrate enough to read, couldn't find anything to watch on television. In fact, she was too worried to do anything but listen to the thunder of the summer storm and the rain drumming on the roof. Why doesn't Ragnar come back? We need him. Tyler must be soaking wet if he's out in this, she thought, but she felt a lot angrier with her brother than she felt sorry for him. How could he do this? Doesn't he know how dangerous it is? It wasn't just going down in an old mine, although that had Tyler's strength stupidity written all over it. But even if he made it back onto Ordinary Farm, what was he going to do there? It was nighttime. Dangerous animals were free and roaming and, according to Desta, not in their right places at all. Suddenly, she wasn't angry. She was just frightened. Really frightened. It seemed like Tyler, the farm, the dragons... Everything was at stake tonight, and here she was waiting for Ragnar to come back. But what if he didn't? Lucinda threw herself back down on the couch and again tried to read her book, but it was almost impossible to keep her eyes on the page. The words kept swimming away from her like frightened fish. She almost didn't hear it at first because of a particularly loud thunderclap that sounded like it was just overhead, but when the thunder died away, it still felt like the whole house was shaking. Knock, knock, knock. Whoever was at the Carrillo's front door wasn't taking it easy. Knock, 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 knock. Lucinda jumped off the couch, but then stopped in front of the door. Who is it? It's me, said a man's voice. And for a moment, just the fact that it wasn't Ragnar or anyone else she knew made her heart lurch. We had an appointment, remember? Lucinda made certain the chain was on before she opened the door. As she peered out, she could see trees whipping in the wind and rain flying in front of the yard lights. The visitor was a handsome older man in an expensive-looking windbreaker, his gray hair swirled all around by the storm. Who are you? she asked. Who are you? He snapped back at her. Lucinda didn't think that was very polite. I'm here to see Sylvia and Hector Carrillo. They're not here. There was something familiar about him that nagged at her. You'll have to come back some other time. Like hell I will. I'll wait. His eyes narrowed. Hold on. I've seen you before. His pale eyes widened in surprise. I know who you are. You're one of the Jenkins children. I, I don't know. I don't know what... But Lucinda had suddenly realized who this was and was trying to close the door. But the man blocked it with his foot. Don't. His voice was flat. He wasn't asking. There are a couple of large men in that car. He nodded toward the sleek black vehicle parked in the driveway. Even when the lightning flashed again, Lucinda couldn't see through its windows. If I call them, they'll kick this door down and things will get unpleasant very quickly. Now, are you going to let me in, young lady? You're Edward Stillman, aren't you? The one who wants Uncle Gideon's farm. She didn't know what to do. It would be crazy to let him in, wouldn't it? But the Carrillos did know him and had talked to him. She'd heard them say that several times. At last, she slipped the chain off the latch and stepped back. Very sensible. Stillman stepped inside and brushed the water from his hair and shoulders. First intelligent thing anybody from Ordinary Farm has done in a long time. He looked her up and down, thankfully not in a creepy, dirty old man way, but not like a normal, nice grown-up either. Your name is Linda, isn't it? No, Lucinda. Ah, yes. And your brother's name is Tyler. Where is he? 
And why did you have to stay home on what should be your big night, Cinderella? Don't you know what they're doing tonight over at your great uncle's place? She had no idea what he was talking about, unless he somehow knew about the manticores getting out, but that didn't seem likely. My brother's not here. The Carrillos aren't here either, and I think you should go. Otherwise, I'll... I'll call the police. Stillman laughed. <laughs> what? You mean the Yokuts County Sheriff's Office? On a night like this, they'll be down at Rosie's interrogating a piece of pie and some coffee, congratulating themselves on being indoors. Then I'll call 911. He shook his head. Don't be stupid, child. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not some villain, you know. You're Gideon. He stole that place from me. And now I suspect he's trying to put it out of my reach forever. But I'm not going to let him do it, you see. Stillman pulled out a slim phone, not much larger than a few playing cards in a pile, and pushed a button. Did you reach anyone there yet? He asked the person on the other end. A moment later, he growled in disgust. Then keep trying, and try Denkel again, too. He shoved the phone back in his breast pocket. Lucinda, who had been looking around the room, trying to decide whether she might be able to escape out the back door, suddenly looked up. Dankel, she said. I know that name. That's the lawyer guy. The one Kingery had met in the park, she remembered, on 4th of July. Had Stillman set that whole thing up? The billionaire gave her a look of annoyance. For a man with a nice face, Lucinda thought, he didn't make many nice faces. Of course you know him. Don't play stupid with me, young lady. He's your great uncle's lawyer, the one who's going to put you and your brother in Gideon's will to inherit the farm. You damn bet you know him. Uncle Gideon's lawyer? Lucinda suddenly felt as though the ground had begun to crumble beneath her feet. Dankle? Is Uncle Gideon's lawyer too? The same guy? Same? What are you trying to pull? Stillman pointed her toward the couch. When she was sitting, he took a chair across from her. The rain was still drumming hard on the roof, but the thunder seemed to be getting further away. Stillman's stare was hard and without kindness. Talk. What do you know about that lawyer? Lucinda took a breath. No. You first. Unless you're going to beat me up or something. You tell me what this is about or I'll just shut up and wait for the Carrillos to get back. Which will be any minute. Stillman stared at her. She could almost see his mind humming like a calculator, thinking up and discarding a hundred different possibilities in a few seconds. He was smart. She needed to remember that. He was smart and mean and rich. At last, he sat up straight. All right, kiddo, you win. Instead of turning this into the Inquisition, we'll bargain. I'll tell you something, you tell me. Deal? She tried to keep her voice more confident than she felt. Deal. We'll start with the lawyer, Stillman said. Barnaby Denkel, an ambulance chaser from over in Liberty. Gideon's used him for years, mainly because they're both cheap but also because Denkel's willing to bend a few rules, look the other way to pick up a few extra billable hours. In other words, he can be bought. And I know, because I bought him too. He laughed harshly. Yes, I've known all of Gideon's legal business for a couple of years now. Denkel tells me everything. That's how I found out a few weeks ago that Gideon was planning to change his will so that if something happened to him, you and your brother would inherit Ordinary Farm. So it was really true. Ordinary Farm was meant to be their inheritance. Lucinda's heart soared, but at the same time a great fear clutched her. How could a couple of kids possibly make something as crazy as Ordinary Farm work? How could they succeed where Gideon himself was failing? But... Changing the will didn't happen, said Stillman. Until tonight, that is. 
Dangle took a cab to your farm half an hour ago. He was expected. They let him inside. Suddenly his voice, which had been calm, grew tense. Your turn, kiddo. Are they changing the will tonight? And why aren't you there? And suddenly things began to make sense. An evil, evil kind of sense. I think they are changing the will, Lucinda said slowly. But it doesn't have anything to do with me or my brother now. It's Mrs. Needle. It has to be. Stillman gave her a skeptical look. What? The housekeeper? I told you, child, don't lie to me. I know too much. You don't know anything. Grown-up men, she was learning, could be just as wrongly sure of themselves as her little brother. She's the one you're fighting. She's your real enemy, not me and Tyler. We're just kids. And it was true. There was very little she could do. But there was a lot that Ed Stillman could accomplish. She told him what she and Tyler had overheard in the Liberty City Park when Dankel met with slave trader Kingery, although obviously she didn't mention Kingery's connection to the fault line. Whatever they're doing, it must be tonight. Lucinda could not, help, could not keep her fear inside any longer. Kingery must be working for her. Mrs. Needle, she's brainwashed Gideon somehow. Drugged him. He's been really sick for weeks. Now, I'll bet she's changing the will so that she and her son, <coughs> excuse me, so that she and her son get the farm. Lucinda knew she was right. She could feel it. Suddenly, she was desperate to find some way to get to Ordinary Farm. Tonight! Stillwell's expression had become less angry, but no less intense. He looked at her like a piece of equipment he was considering buying one that might or might not do the job. Tonight, is it? he said at last. Well, that two-faced shyster Dankel is going to get a shock, and so's this needle woman if she really thinks she's going to steal something. That rightfully belongs to Edward Stillman. He stood up and headed for the door. Take me with you, Lucinda cried, hurrying after him. She couldn't just sit here reading on the couch while the world came to an end. I, I can help you get in. I know the place. Stillman laughed at her as if she told him she could lend him money. You're joking, right? You help me? Lightning flared outside the window. My brother's on his way there. He's trying to sneak onto the property. I, I have to find him. She hated doing it, but she let her feelings into her voice. She was pleading with a man who might be the farm's worst enemy. Please help me. Please. He considered for a moment, then showed a small, crooked smile. All right. Get a jacket. It's pouring. That was almost like a normal human being, Lucinda thought, but she didn't let it fool her. Thank you, but... I have to leave a note. Hurry up, then. His moment of amusement was over. She scribbled a quick note. I'm okay. We'll be back soon, Lucinda, and followed Ed Stillman out the door with her jacket pulled over her head and water splashing all around her feet. The front yard was turning into mud. The rear door of the big car swung open as they approached. Stillman pushed her inside next to a large black man. Make room, deuce, we have company. Stillman swung himself in beside her, then called to the bulky white man in the driver's seat. Go, Tinker Farm. He turned to stare out the window as the driver swung them out onto the main road. God, this is a hellish night, and it's only going to get worse for somebody. On Lucinda's other side, Big Deuce laughed a man cheerfully looking forward to some serious unpleasantness. His arms were as big around as Lucinda's waist. She huddled down in the soft leather seat and began to wonder whether this had really been such a good idea. And that's where we're going to stop. And tomorrow night, or tonight, I will continue with chapter 29, 
the amazing needle scope. But that will be later. And in the interim, um, I will thank you all for joining me and hanging out with me. Um, I am very, very pleased to have had a chance to spend some time with you. And we seem to have kept the reading going the whole time, which is always a good thing. Um, where we don't suddenly go off the air, especially for the Sunday morning, the early Sunday morning crew, which seems to get the brunt of the technical problems more often. So my apologies for that. But anyway, we seem to have made it through. I will be reading at 7 p.m. my time here later today. I don't know about next week. Um, as I said uh, a couple times now, you're going to have to check my Facebook pages uh, to find out what's going on because... Um, as I mentioned, we're in the middle of moving and there will come a time in the next couple of weeks where I will be verklempt in terms of trying to deal with things. So with that, I say thank you very much for joining me. Be good to yourselves. Be good to your loved ones and friends and neighbors and your countless relations and Alexander Beadle. And I will... Uh, see you real soon, one way or the other. So thank you for joining me. Peace and good night. Or good morning, as the case may be.